Hi, everyone. I'm Teresa Rejak Talley, the Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion at Dalhousie University. I'm pleased to welcome you to Dalhousie University's Open Dialogue Live, a series of weekly conversations featuring Dalhousie experts on current issues. <clears throat> I'd first like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mimaki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Last week, episode one, the focus was on why there's a need to take a human rights approach to a COVID-19 situation in the black communities, persons living with disabilities and homeless individuals here in Nova Scotia. Today, episode part two of our vulnerable populations during COVID-19 will once again explore how pandemics impact socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. Before we get to today's discussion, I would like to take the opportunity to recognize and show appreciation to the people who have been referred to as first responders, frontline and essential workers. In particular, I would like to publicly publicly thank our campus personnel, our ancillary staff, the custodians, safety officers, and others who in many ways are our vulnerable populations because we rarely recognize what they do for us pre-COVID, during, and will continue to do so post-COVID. I would like now to officially welcome all your viewers into my home and to the homes of the panelists, those who are near and far. I say far because I understand my niece and her college friends from Toronto are also tuned in because of the topic for today's session. So please grab your favorite cup of tea and uh, coffee and sit back while I introduce our panelists. Our panelists consist of Dr. Adelina Iftene, a professor in Dalhousie's Schulich School of Law, who will discuss the spread of COVID-19 in prisons and its impact on incarcerated individuals in the larger community. Sheila Wildman, who's also a professor in the Schulich School of Law and a member of the Health Law Institute, who will offer her expertise on what can be done to stop COVID-19 from continuing to disproportionately burden the health and human rights of persons with disabilities and other interlocking vulnerabilities. Our last speaker, Constant McIntosh, Viscount Bennett Professor of Law and member of Dalhousie's Health Law Institute will speak to the impact on the First Nation communities. During the presentations, we encourage you, our viewers, to post your questions online. A little later in the program, we'll relay some of these questions to our presenters. To begin, I will now ask Dr. Adelina Iftene to begin our episode with discussing how the spread of COVID-19 in prison impacts those who are incarcerated and the larger community. Adelina, the floor is yours, thanks. Hi everyone, and thank you so much, Teresa, for the introduction. Thank you, Barrett, for uh, having me here today. It, uh, it's uh, quite lovely to join the conversation together with my uh, colleagues. Um, as Teresa mentioned, I am going to address today the issue of um, the impact of the pandemic on the uh, incarcerated population in Canada, so not just in Nova Scotia, but across the country, um, as well as um, why the rates of infection appear to have been uh, higher in prisons than in the larger community, and what does that mean not only for the incarcerated people, uh, but also for uh, the public at large, for uh, for public health um, uh, and the, the impact on public health. So just by way of context, um, in any given day, there are about 40,000 people incarcerated across Canada. 25,000 of these are in provincial institutions. Provincial institutions um, are um, administered by their respective provinces. Um, and they incarcerate people that are either awaiting trial or are serving short sentences, um, a few weeks or um, anywhere up to two years. The federal prisons known as penitentiaries um, incarcerate people that are serving long sentences. So uh, two years or more, life in prison, any of that. They are administered by the federal government through an agency called Correctional Service Canada, or CSC for short. 
And, um, and there are about 14,000 people uh, incarcerated in penitentiaries at the moment, both uh, men and women. Now, it's very important, I think, for the conversation today to note the fact that um, marginalized communities, the ones that you would have heard about during the last episode or the, later on in today's episode, are overrepresented in prisons. So, um, and, and part of the reason for that is because really the social determinants of poor health, of marginalization, are the same as those for um, uh, criminalization and incarceration. And for instance, to give you an example, um, indigenous people are forming 30% right now of uh, incarcerated people in federal prisons, uh, while in the community, they're just 4%. So really very high rates. The same thing um, uh, we see with African Canadians and in particular African Nova Scotia, um, people with mental disabilities and physical disabilities are overrepresented in prisons. I think it's fair to say that in the past few decades, Prison has really become the answer, by and large, to a lot of social problems. And this is something that definitely precedes the pandemic, but has put a different spin or has raised different issues uh, in light of the public health crisis that's currently ongoing. Um, research is showing that my research, my colleagues' research, is showing that a lot because of this marginalization, um, a lot of the illnesses that are now known to be risk factors for COVID-19, so risk factor of infections, but also risk factors uh, for severe complication, including death, uh, are also overrepresented among incarcerated people. So in general, incarcerated people have higher rates of communicable diseases. Uh, for instance, HIV rates are 15 times higher in prison than community. Um, Hep C is 30 times higher in prison than community non-communicable diseases such as um, uh, diabetes, cancers, um, cardiovascular illness, pulmonary disease are all have higher rates in prison than in the community. Same with mental illness, with addictions, and all of these are known to be risk factors for COVID. As well, 25% of the federal prison population is now considered elderly. We know that age is another risk factor. So if we put all of those together, we realize that actually um, the, a very high percentage of the prison population already has, as a demographic, uh, uh, an enhanced susceptibility to the infection. And in addition to that, the prison environment itself, uh, both as a congregate in living place and specifically as a prison, uh, presents its own risks. Uh, it is much difficult to uh, provide for social distance in such spaces, uh, to provide proper cleaning supplies, and it is the healthcare system are notoriously poor uh, in in prisons across the country. So normally, when you know when you have such a crisis, uh, uh, the response is expected to be very swift and very strong in all congregated places, but especially in spaces where the populations are very vulnerable. And in terms of prison, the best practices are showing that, you know, there are really two prongs in how this should be approached. One of them, uh, again, not only typical to prisons, but to any congregate living space, is to depopulate the extent possible. Um, it's really not a time for punitiveness because in reality, the crisis, um, and it's a much bigger threat to public safety than some of the individuals that could safely be decarcerated. Secondly, once the depopulation has taken place, uh, the protocols in terms of prevention and treatment needs to be uh, adopted and they need to be attuned to uh, the public health uh, uh, guidelines. Now, the response in Canada has been very, very wide and very different from provinces to federal. Um, some of the provinces, a lot of the provinces have actually decarcerated quite significantly. Uh, which has had a very positive effect in stopping the infection inside. Uh, Nova Scotia in particular has done really well. Uh, Nova Scotia has decarcerated half of its prison population. My colleague Sheila Wildman has been running a crusade for decarceration. You're going to hear from her in a bit. Um, it's been really good and the results are visible. So um, right now in Nova Scotia in the provincial prison, there is one confirmed COVID case. Um, and across the country, there are 87. So um, out of a population of 25,000, that's, that's sort of manageable. On the other hand, the response has been very different in the penitentiaries. 
Uh, the uh, CSC has resisted depopulating the prison uh, the, the prisoners. Um, to date, there has been only one person that has been decarcerated on account of COVID, and that person is a terminally ill man uh, who is a few months away from his uh, from his release anyway. And his release happened um, on the background of uh, threat of legal action. At the same time, according to CSC's own numbers, there are thousands of people. And when I say thousand, I mean like between 3,000 and 5,000 people um, that are deemed to be low risk to public safety and high risk uh, for illnesses or are very close to their release date, like weeks or months, or who have been granted release, but the process has been stopped by the pandemic. None of these people have been released and uh, there are no plans that are made public to release any of these individuals at the moment. Um, and the consequences of this resistance has been quite dramatic uh, in terms of, uh, of lives and in terms of health. Um, evidence emerging from federal prisons is showing that the prevention protocols are not very efficient at the moment. Um, what it means is that social distancing is still very difficult. We do have an, an overcrowding rate of about 30%, so again, very difficult to see how social distancing would work, um, significant chronic shortage of health personnel, and the main response to the crisis, both preventive and as treatment, has been uh, locking people up in solitary, well, forms of solitary confinement. They're called medical isolation, but they are essentially the same thing. So people that are infected are locked up up to 24 hours a day. They have 20 minutes to go out of their cells, uh, either for a shower or a call, they have to choose. People who are not infected in some places are locked up for 22 hours as a prevention. Um, of course, this has spiked the, the mental health uh, acute issues. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of uh, suicide attempts, self-harm, uh, withdrawal, overdoses, which are very hard to manage even in a non-crisis time. Um, what's even worse, well, equally bad, um, but on top of it all, is the fact that uh, the rate of COVID-19 infection has been very, very high. Um, even though it started, the infection has entered prisons about a month after it, it, uh, 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 it hit the community. However, right now there are over 500 people that are um, related to federal prisons who are infected. Over 400 of those are incarcerated people. That means that there is a rate of infection uh, in prisons that is 13 times higher than in the community. And the hardest with were the women. Um, right now, the rate of infection among incarcerated women is 77 times higher than in the community, which is dramatic. Um, so as we're talking about flattening the curve in the community, uh, we have these hot spots like seniors homes and prisons that are essentially um, not allowing us to, to properly uh, flatten it because, because the virus cannot really be contained within the prison walls. So um, in terms of just quickly, in terms of consequences, um, of course, there are very serious concerns regarding you know, equity gaps um, that are being more visible now in the pandemic among the various populations in Canada and the overrepresented marginalized people um, uh, in, uh, in prisons are definitely seeing, um, uh, feeling the consequences of that gap equity. But also, and it, of course, uh, the treatment of these people and the fact that the responses have not uh, measured up to the challenge that the pandemic has raised uh, has led some to say, you know, it, this is a, a really a death sentence for the incarcerated people a lot of times. And um, there are lots of ho uh, rights concerns and uh, uh, human rights concerns, uh, statutory concerns regarding how this will be handled. A lot of um, lawsuits are starting to uh, be worked up by various groups. Um, but beyond all of this, there is also public health concerns. Um, one of them, as I mentioned, the virus is not contained. People go in and out of prisons all the time, and they are, you know, what we see in the prison is being spills in the community. Um, these people, as I mentioned, are very uh, susceptible to illness. 
um, to long-term and short-term consequences of COVID-19. They are burdening the healthcare system that really impacts all of us. Um, and uh, more so, they are going to return to their communities in a worse shape that they entered prison. Um, and again, they are returning to a lot of times to marginalized communities that are already overburdened. So, you know, having people that ha are in dire healthcare need because of they felt so strongly the impact of the pandemic, returning to an indigenous community is going to be uh, have very bad consequences, not only on the individual, but also on the community uh, itself. So um, I'm going to have to stop here, but I just want to uh, to 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 end on an, by saying that, you know, we really see these discrepancies and a lot of the problems that we're seeing in prisons now are not created by the pandemic, are only heightened by the pandemic. Our overuse and over-reliance um, on prisons to essentially respond to social needs um, is now sort of catching up with us as a community. And I'm hoping that if there's something positive to come out of this, it's going to be that um, policymakers, lawmakers, and the public at large is going to start understanding that prison health is public health and that uh, criminal justice decisions that are being made in uh, parliament and by policymakers really have an impact on all of us and all our health. And sometimes there is, um, you know, public safety means also public health. You cannot ensure public safety without public health. And proper um, carceral practices and uh, reduced uh, incarceration would actually benefit both public health and public safety more than the over-incarceration that we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iftini. I'm sure we have lots more that we can talk about during the discussion period, but viewers, you heard it from the expert. Prison health is public health. I would like to now ask Professor Sheila Wildman, can you please tell us, based on your expertise, what can be done to stop COVID-19 from continuing to disproportionately burden the health and human rights of persons with disabilities? Thank you, Teresa, and uh, thanks so much, Adelina, for setting the stage the way that you have. Uh, I want to say this pandemic has certainly exposed uh, some of the most urgent vulnerabilities in our communities, as Ad Adelina has been discussing, but it's also reminded us of many of our strengths uh, and our uh, ingenuity and imagination. And I, I just want to say I'm so lucky to have colleagues like both Adelina and Constance, who will be speaking after me, whose work uh, informs my own in many ways is deeply interconnected with the work I do, which like theirs focuses on populations that by reason of socioeconomic marginalization and exclusion, um, are structurally more vulnerable to a pandemic like the one that we're in now. And as Teresa said, the population that I focus on is persons with disabilities. What I'm gonna focus on um, even more specifically uh, is the phenomenon of institutionalization. So the culture of confinement and control that we have constructed in response to a set of overlapping vulnerabilities that tend to kind of come together under the description of disability. So let me just pick up where Adelina left off because I want to expand on that a little bit before I move uh, more centrally to my subject. I was involved, as Adelina said, uh, in the provincial jail release advocacy here in Nova Scotia, which started in about mid-March. And uh, from mid-March on, we saw an incredible arc of activity in response to the challenges and the pressures that Adelina has described. So in recognition of the fact that prisons, or in this case, uh, provincial jails, are sites of vulnerability, special vulnerability to COVID, and are, as Adelina said, potential vectors of contagion because they're porous, because people are passing in and out. And the activity that we saw from mid-March on included in about a three week period release, as she said, of about 50% of our incarcerated, provincially incarcerated 
population, so those subject to sentences of two years uh, or less. And also beyond that, and I guess as part of that, we saw the striking of working groups across government departments, across sectors, bridging government and community groups, in some cases bridging community groups in new ways, all to you know, respond to this emergency that we knew uh, was uh, imminent and then was right, you know, we were in the midst of it. Um, and the common goal was to assemble the resources needed to enable uh, access for those people granted expedited release. So now moving from the prison context that Adelina has so carefully described, um, bridging from that to community. <clears throat> so the goal after those releases started happening through a variety of legal mechanisms, the goal was to enable sustained community residency. And there are a whole set of barriers to sustained community residency uh, for persons who are criminalized and incarcerated. And we really were focusing on three you know, pillars of sustained residency, and those are housing, access to housing, and in this case, housing consistent with COVID-19 protocols, access to income, uh, and that's very tricky for people exiting jail, accessing income assistance, even if they were on it before, uh, and other problems, and accessing healthcare and addictions management. All of those are uh, serious barriers to sustained community release, as are legal frameworks that tend to penalize people when they breach conditions, and, and uh, in a time of COVID-19, there's even more pressures that make it likely people may breach um, so that's a story that's still being written, and it's a story that centers in many ways on people with disabilities, people who may be described in this sector as, you know, high acuity or hard to house, uh, uh, you know, people who uh, have be behavioral challenges and the rest uh, of it. Um, it's people with disabilities who are also uh, people experiencing poverty, who are in many ways at the center of that ongoing story. So. Supporting sustained release uh, from uh, prisons and jails is a story that's still being written. We're gonna see uh, grave gaps and failures to follow through in community with what has been done in those uh, jurisdictions where something has been done on the side of release. But there have been starts made and it's heartening to see, as I said, you know, these cross-sector government community uh, uh, efforts, initiatives, to try and rethink, to reimagine community supports uh, to uh, uh, enable access to the social determinants of health, which as Adelina said, are also the social determinants of decarceration. So let me just turn from that example to my work that's more focused specifically on disability and disability institutions, as I'll call them, uh, and law. Oh, am I gone? I just saw in the notes, it says I was lost. Uh, people, other people are saying that I am, oh, sorry, there was a, <laughs> there was something in the chat saying my connection was lost, but I seem to be, uh, I seem not to be lost. Uh, my work, which I'm trying to now recover, focuses on uh, disability and law um, and what I was calling disability institutions and the legal frameworks around them. So much of my work has explored decision-making capacity and medical and legal models of decision-making authority, focusing on how international and domestic human rights can help reorient our accounts of decision-making capacity from a model uh, that is individualized and medicalized to one of supported decision-making. One element of supported decision-making is a context of meaningful options. So you don't get much practice making decisions when there's only one option and moreover, it's pretty grim, whether about what you have for breakfast or where and with whom you can live. And that takes me to the subject of institutionalization and COVID. So in recent years, my work's been moving more generally to how law can be harnessed to incentivize a shift away from what we might call a culture of confinement or control a culture of institutionalization as a response to disability um, to a culture of support. And that includes enabling access, as I you know, said before, 
to the social determinants of health. So I'm interested in how disability interacts with other social markers of difference and exclusion. And the prison is a perfect example of those interactions as Adelina brought out. There we see complex interactions of racialization and indigeneity, historical trauma with potentially deep psychological as well as somatic effects, poverty and other structural vulnerabilities um, that render people vulnerable to a number of things. And in this case, um, to COVID-19 contagion. Uh, I've focused shifting from the prison on other what we might call sites of concern during COVID-19. So places where persons are marginalized or who were pre prior marginalized and excluded are further marginalized and excluded as a matter of forced, you know, single option, congregate living. So here's a couple of examples. I think my time is uh, getting uh, short. So I'll, I'll end with a couple of examples. A few weeks, a couple of colleagues and I uh, in disability law wrote a comment on a website, social media site called Ricochet, and it was titled Viruses Feed on Exclusion. It was focused on psychiatric detention and the need for preventive decarceration in civil and forensic mental health detention spaces, as well as prisons, for the same sorts of reasons. So difficulty or impossibility of social or physical distancing, uh, concerns uh, about hygiene and other forms of conformity with COVID-19 protocols, concerns about porousness, yes, as between institutions and the wider community, and concerns about the rates of underlying health vulnerabilities of the folks who are located in those sites. Uh, we used as an example Nova Scotia's East Coast Forensic Hospital where it was confirmed just a few weeks ago that at least 20 of approximately 50 patients had been granted conditional release by the board that has authority to do that, so community-based release, uh, and that had been true of some of these folks for months or years, but they were still there, and they were there in a time of COVID-19 and the rapid, you know, urgent decarceration happening uh, in the neighboring prison uh, didn't seem to be happening in that space. At least I haven't had any confirmation that much in that order has happened uh, since there or in parallel types of sites um, that were our concern in that article that I've just mentioned. The only thing preventing the release of those uh, forensic uh, detainees was arrangement of a suitable community-based supportive living placement. For three of the 20, there was no need for special disability support program services, just an appropriate rental space in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Um, as I say, I haven't had a report for a couple of weeks as to whether residents have been moved out or under what circumstances, but this, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say here is that this isn't just about emergency pandemic responses or pre preparedness. It's about the ways that the pandemic brings into relief or sharper focus a set of underlying structural harms that remind us some have been living in conditions of what we're now, now calling emergency or emergency response, conditions like forced seclusion and separation from community for decades at one site or another. I'll give you just another uh, example and a focus in my academic work as well as community partnerships. And that's what I'll call disability institutions. Now, one form of disability institution, or I'll class it that way, is long-term care. Uh, and we know that the rates of deaths in long-term care, COVID-related deaths, are uh, have been very high across Canada. In Nova Scotia, on May 1st, sorry, May 5th, it was reported that uh, Long-term care was the site of 85% of Nova Scotia's COVID-related uh, deaths. Uh, so long-term care is obviously a heightened site of concern and a site of uh, congregate living uh, uh, of the form that I've been uh, describing as inconsistent with COVID protections. My focus has been other long-term residency facilities for adults with disabilities. So developmental disabilities, mental health disabilities, autism, 
sometimes physical disabilities. In Nova Scotia, we have a range of sites like this from large facilities of 100 or more people um, to smaller, more group home style facilities, uh, uh, common markers or shared washrooms, shared rooms often. So again, these are places that are inconsistent with the physical distancing expected of COVID-19 protocols, as well as often disproportionate rates of health conditions that render people more vulnerable to the worst effects of COVID-19. Um, so I'll just wind up recognizing that we want to move on to my colleague uh, now, uh, Constance, but to sum up, Adelina's described one site of exclusion and forced conditions of congregate living inconsistent with COVID-19 and subject to rapid preventative measures. I'm turning your attention to some other sites of concern, long-term care, as well as disability institutions that for many years have languished uh, with advocates pushing for deinstitutionalization and the opening up of smaller community-based residences, more consistent with liberty uh, and equality, as well as access to the social determinants of health. Um, and I wanna just uh, close with that. And I hope that that's a, a conversation that we can continue to, to have in the question period. Thank you, Professor Wildman, for expanding on the conversation we had about in incarcerated population and to transition us to the situation with persons of disabilities and more so for reminding us that we have to shift from a culture of confinement to a culture of support. With that in mind, I would like to now introduce our third panelist, Professor Constant McIntosh, who will now speak to us on the impact of COVID-19 on First Nation communities in Canada. So Constant, the, the virtual talking. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. So I'm going to be focusing on the situation in uh, First Nation communities, um, both the, the heightened level of vulnerabilities which are experienced there, and then move into some really amazing initiatives that communities have undertaken to protect themselves. But first, I just want to quickly make some links back to the comments that Adelina and Sheila have already shared with us. Um, Adelina mentioned the disproportionate uh, representation of Indigenous peoples in incarcerated settings. And I just need to add to that, that within that population, um, the incarcerated population of Indigenous peoples also have higher rates of autoimmune disorders like HIV um, and hepatitis C, which are linked with very serious outcomes for COVID-19. Um, and just a, a slight gesture towards uh, Sheila's work, um, not uh, long-term care facilities, but, but the foster care system. Um, so Indigenous youth in particular, we know are um, extremely overrepresented in, in the foster care system, in group homes, um, some of whom are supposed to travel back and forth between youth corrections and, and foster homes, or are on the street, which once again place them in this, this, this higher risk scenario. So COVID-19 has highlighted for us these, these gross uh, social and health inequities. Um, the disparities have been compounded um, just like they were for Indigenous communities, once again, back in 2009 with the H1N1 um, outbreak. So H1N1, uh, like COVID-19, it, it's spread by, by droplets. Um, and H1N1 hit Canada in, in two waves. So the first wave, 25% um, of the people who ended up in the ICU were Indigenous, despite being 5% of the population. 18% um, of the women who were pregnant who ended up in the ICU, once again, they were Indigenous. And of those who uh, passed away, 20% um, in the first wave were Indigenous. A um, couple of reasons that help to explain these outrageous um, uh, data points. Um, there's, there's both factors which uh, make the communities 
um, sort of in factors of inequity, which make these communities more vulnerable. And there's also factors which make them less able to protect themselves. Um, the, you know, we are told to uh, wash our hands, to self isolate, to do all of these things to protect themselves. Um, but of course, really the easiest way to stay safe is to have great health supports since day one, um, which people living in many First Nation communities uh, do not have. They experience um, considerable amounts of, of, of strain in trying to uh, access health resources and are often dependent on you know, remote nursing stations with really hard workers in them, but those workers are, well, they're under-resourced um, settings. Um, another way to stay healthy is, quite frankly, to be wealthy. Um, poverty is probably the number one determinant of, of health. Um, and our 2019 stats show that 49% of, of First Nation children um, live in poverty. Um, another way to go is, of course, is to have a nice house to live in and self-isolate in. And quite frankly, we're not doing that well with housing. Um, and First Nation communities. So the, the housing shortage in communities is, is dire. Um, the estimates range between 40,000 and 80,000 units are needed um, in First Nation communities in Canada. So what does this mean? Well, this means incredible overcrowding. You have many generations living under the same roof in houses that are simply too small for the number of people, right? Whole families sharing one bedrooms, 13 people in one building. So we have uh, grandparents and children and cousins living together, which on the one hand is wonderful, only the space is too small. Um, you cannot effectively isolate people. Um, someone in that group is likely to have those underlying health conditions, which makes them more vulnerable. And then of course the houses themselves are not necessarily safe locations to be in, especially if you become sick because of features like mold, which is rampant in uh, homes in many other remote communities. Um, we all know that there has been infusion towards supporting uh, addressing the housing uh, deficit, but it, it's far below need. And I spent a lot of time looking at, at building codes. Somehow these things become important when you're trying to unravel the role of law. And what we see is that the building codes aren't enforced. Um, they are um, ignored or sometimes they're just unrealistic because the, the building supplies themselves are unavailable or they're just too expensive. Um, I'm just gonna speak quickly um, about the situation of remote communities because they are at the risk of being hit the hardest. So some communities are uh, hours away um, with uh, limited access by road. Um, perhaps there are fly-in situations. There's about 96 in Canada that are, that are fly-in uh, communities which means that if the virus gets there, it's going to be, um, it's going to be quite uh, horrendous. Um, communities are working hard to take actions to prevent the virus from reaching them. And it's been heartening um, seeing the actions that they have taken to protect themselves. So many communities have acted under their, their bylaws, which permit the creation of uh, laws with regards to quarantines. And they have imposed upon themselves standards which are, I'm gonna say beyond what we're seeing in any other uh, community within Canada. So communities are self-isolating as communities. They are creating blockades and refusing entry to uh, non-community members. Uh, they are establishing checkpoints, um, not permitting people to actually leave uh, unless they are seeking essential services, um, and then being screened for their health, at least for their temperature, upon um, return. We're seeing communities trying desperately to um, protect their territory. So for example, some communities have stated that they don't want to see any tree planting taking place in their community until the risk is over. Um, one of the dramatic things that we've been seeing here at some Nova Scotian communities as well is uh, the creation of, of curfews. So 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., some of them they're starting as early as 7 o'clock at night. 
I mean, that's how seriously the communities are, are taking the situation because they are um, recalling uh, the impact of uh, influenza, um, smallpox, smallpox wiped out over 30 to 50 percent um, of, of communities in Canada when it when it swept through. Um, and as provinces reopen, communities are quite frankly, not willing to go along with them. So for example, Manitoba has started reopening measures, um, but many First Nation communities in Manitoba are keeping their, their barricades up. And they are insisting that, for example, if someone leaves and goes to Winnipeg, they will not be allowed to return to the community um, because they know that if the virus reaches them, that between delayed testing, um, and their underlying health inequities and the crowding um, and the limits on medical evacuation that they could once again see uh, people being uh, well, devastating impacts upon the communities in, immediately into, into a crisis. Um, all of these factors that create the compounded vulnerability from the, the health inequities um, to some of the factors that have to do with just basic uh, living standards, none of this stuff is new. We knew about all of these things. They were foregrounded with H1N1. They've been foregrounded repeatedly by various Senate reports and other investigations. Um, and obviously what many of us are hoping for is that we're gonna finally see something of a, a turning point such that we actually remedy these uh, vulnerabilities, like beyond providing hand sanitizers um, to actually get appropriate human resources, housing and, and poverty matters um, addressed. And I'll just leave my comments there. So we have a few moments for um, questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Adelina, Sheila and Constant for that. Uh, for sharing your expertise with our viewers tonight and for highlighting how socioeconomic conditions come into all the populations that we discussed this evening and given rise to the concept of overcrowding and poverty. So thank you very much. I know there are lots of questions out there, so please post your questions online and as they pop up, you can address them. So. I see there's one already there, and the question is, where can we put public pressure to demand better conditions for prisoners? So I know Adelina, you talked a lot about it, but everybody else had some input, so we can start with you and then we can move along. Um, everywhere. I think that pressure needs to be put absolutely everywhere because um, it's really something that um, you know, we've been working on for a very, very long time. And I think uh, part of the reason why the government has gotten away with it the way it has is because uh, prisoners are a forgotten, forsaken group um, and the public is not really requesting. This is not something that makes its way on, on uh, electoral agendas. It's not something that people turn their minds on. And there's a lot of misinformation in the public about, about sentencing and about punishment. So concretely speaking, you should write to your MP, you should write and request that before casting a vote, whether it's provincially or federally, you should ask about the electoral um, agendas regarding prisons and criminal justice. It's something that I, I made a, a project with my students and there was one page between the four major parties on the criminal justice issues on their electoral agendas. So, so little, like, I think the public needs to ask about and need to be engaged with these issues and they will become better. Also, you could join the many advocacy groups that are currently um, exist in Nova Scotia, it's East Coast Prison Justice Society, um, but there are many, many others, uh, Elizabeth Fry, John Howard Society, that are actually helping a lot of systematic advocacy that is being done and a lot of groundwork to determine policymakers and to inform the public on the harms that are being done. So those are just um, a few ways in which people can get involved and demand for uh, better conditions of confinement. And quite frankly, the 
first step to start is get involved, you know, um, get get um, get informed about what the issues are. Um, so then uh, you can actually talk to people about it, inform friends, inform neighbors. Uh, and really, it starts with, with caring and fa not turning a blind eye to this population. Great. Thank you. While we wait for the other question to pop up, does anyone from the other panel would like to say something? Could add something uh, quickly. So, uh, apart from the important focus on uh, imprisonment, imprisonment policy itself, um, there's of course the, the complementary focus that came out of all of our talks on socioeconomic supports. Yeah. And I note that uh, Senator Kim Haight has been kind of at one of the people at the forefront of the work on basic income. So, looking for. Uh, structural uh, socioeconomic change to support decarceration in the long term is something that I think is really important. The, the other thing that I'd add is I, during the time of COVID, coming at the cusp also of um, all the work that's been done or at the, you know, at the far edge of all the work that's been done around solitary confinement, there has been, or at least it seems that way to me, quite a strong public response, a turn in public sentiment around criminalized and incarcerated populations that's quite remarkable. So a couple of weeks ago, there was a masthead editorial in the Globe and Mail that some folks might have seen that uh, was basically a plea for decarceration uh, in, you know, looking at the model of COVID saying, wow, all these people were released, including all those people remanded prior to trial. Why don't we just do that all the time? And the suggestion was made, again, this is a masthead editorial from the Globe and Mail. They said, why aren't people just sentenced to complete high school, say, or to take a university course rather than incarceration? So I love that people just in the public are asking these questions. Why not respond to criminalized behavior in a way that strengthens rather than weakens the resiliency of the individual as well as the community? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question on screen. Uh, do you think there are ways that governments could better build vulnerable communities into their COVID-19 recovery plans? What kind of commissions or structures might be helpful? Very loaded question, Kim, but we, <laughs> have, we have a very talented group of panelists that I'm sure could respond. Um, Constant, do you want to start? Well, <laughs> um, so I have to say that uh, one of the lessons that was learned with H1N1 was that there needed to be uh, really meaningful coordination between First Nation governments and provincial and federal governments uh, in this sort of a situation. And as things with COVID were beginning to develop, there were some really great efforts made to create that kind of coordination, which hadn't happened before. What was left out entirely, however, was the Indigenous population who did not live in First Nation communities. The Métis people largely cast aside the urban Indigenous population um, pretty much invisible until it was uh, late April before any jurisdiction recognized any responsibility to start working with them. Um, so I, I think that the, the first piece of this is ensuring that there is meaningful representation um, of people in the groups that are, are responding and going forward. Um, I mentioned that we had seen some great coordination between uh, First Nation communities and the federal government and provincial governments. I would say that we're beginning to see that break down a little bit when the plans of provincial governments are at odds with those of the First Nation communities. Um, and we're also seeing some tension points um, with regards to things like work camps because provinces and the federal government are very concerned about work camps in uh, mining, uh, in areas where there's mining and uh, pipelines uh, being constructed going forward, and they are not engaging with the First Nation communities on the potential impacts to their health and well-being in having these uh, thousand men work camp in, in their local areas. 
So structures that recognize these sorts of impact, um, I think are very important. And I'll, I'll step back and let uh, Sheila or Adelina speak now. Um, do you see the questions on screen, right? What kind of commissions or structures would you like to see that would be helpful to the COVID-19 recovery plans? Adelina, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to be quick. Just um, you know, off top, I, I think there there are lots of things that could be done actually, and I think that in in, the, in there is in a certain way, you know, as we're all trying thinking of you know, uh, hoping that things are going to return to normal uh, soon enough. I think that for all of these communities, including the prisons, returning to normal should not be an option. I think that COVID-19 um, uh, have shown some of the very serious weaknesses uh, in terms of uh, the way that we treat these communities. And um, if anything's going to come out that's positive, should be the fact that our responses uh, to their needs and the crisis need to change from what it was before the pandemic. Um, I think that uh, at least for the federal prisons, a task force is going to be, should be looking, should be uh, mandated by the government to look into what happened. Um, and I mean, while I can, I, we can probably guess what happened, one of the big problems that, that is uh, surrounds the secrecy um, and the lack of transparency of, of the correctional agency in terms of what are the protocols that have been used, um, uh, what are the preventive measures. There is very poor oversight overall for, for prison systems and how they respond to this crisis. So um, there is a need of, of gathering this information, finding the gaps in their responses and addressing them better. But by the same token, uh, we really need to take a, a step back and look very, very seriously as our uh, sentencing processes and our broader carceral practices, and as Sheila mentioned, uh, more broadly at social justice issues. That is the long-term way of actually preventing this from happening. Um, anything else is really just a, a knee-jerk reaction and a short-term band-aid. I, I can add to that just uh, quickly. Um, so back to the example that I gave of decarceration efforts here in Nova Scotia, um, one of the things that happened around uh, the rapid decarceration that we saw during that three week period was the establishment of some, and I know that there were many tables with sort of cross departmental uh, and representation of public health, of justice, of community services, right? So there was a lot of cross departmental work and the work around decarceration was, uh, I think, special because we included community groups in uh, in that. So we had uh, the Department of Ju Deputies of Justice, uh, Community Services, and Municipal Affairs or Housing coming together with representatives from a coalition of community groups that are uh, aimed at supporting people on the front lines when they get out of prisons, from Elizabeth Fry societies to here at, in Nova Scotia, it's, it's meaningful Coverdale Court Work Society, also the uh, uh, Native uh, Negro Friendship Center, uh, Direction 180, supporting people with addiction. So it was that kind of um, diverse working group, both at a high policy level and also then at an operations level in terms of coordinating case planning. It showed to me how it is possible to strike these conversations so that government is at least aware of where the gaps and the barriers are and solutions that community has who have the relationships and are on the ground uh, to try and respond to those. I would love to see a similar kind of move happening in the disability sector. I have not. And, uh, at, you know, in my, in my experience, uh, I have not seen it in the same way as I saw in that uh, context. So the Disability Rights Coalition reached out as I understand it, to the Department of uh, Community Services to uh, plea for an inclusive process of COVID response planning. And the response, as I understand it, and you can look on the Disability Rights Coalition website for it, they put it up, uh, was this is a time of real a lot of pressures and uh, we'll have to wait until the emergency is over before we do that sort of work. So I just think it, we need to, we need to um, create these new models of inclusiveness now. Right, thank you. I think uh, governments usually tend to suffer a little bit from amnesia. So it's always good to have 
people like us remind them of what is happening. Uh, the other question on the screen um, is, why are incarcerated women experiencing an infection rate 77 times higher? What has been done to respond to that? Well, that's, uh, well it's a, it's a, I think it's a complex answer. Yeah. Um, so on one hand, um, you know, the, the, obviously the number of men infected is higher than the number of women. But the rate of women infected is higher because um, on one hand, the prison population, the women are a smaller number. They only comprise under 10% of the all incarcerated people. Um, and the other thing is, so that's why we see that rate being so high. But the other thing is that um, there have been outbreaks in five penitentiaries in Canada, and two of those were penitentiaries for women. Now, there aren't very many. There are like five in the whole Canada. So uh, nearly half of them have been very seriously hit by the pandemic, right? So that's why we see uh, significant more women uh, rate-wise being infected. Um, by the same token, it can be argued that in this situation, you know, the lack of response or the inaction of the government and the failure to implement measures properly has disproportionately impacted the women, right? And unfortunately, this is not new. Uh, women have been a marginalized group within a marginalized group for a very, very long time. Uh, they have a lot of times they are, um, even though they are much lower risk overall as a group than men are, uh, they, uh, they have higher rates of abuse, a past history of abuse, of mental illness. Um, they, have, they have suffered horrible conditions of confinement. So women are generally uh, disproportionately punished uh across and i think really this is just uh yet another symptom if a very very outrageous one of the same kind of neglect and the same kind of um of uh indifference on the side of the government uh in how they are treating uh how they're treating incarcerated women can i just make I a back to constance's point around uh uh, the uh, structural vulnerabilities to COVID among indigenous populations. And your point, Adelina, that 40% of federally sentenced women are indigenous. Yeah. 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 And what is being done by the government so far squat all. So not much. I think we have time for one more question. Would anybody like to put one up on the screen? Uh, but anybody, well, while we are waiting, if we have time for one more, uh, are there any last comments that each one of you want to let the viewers know of before I formally close the session? Last thoughts, anybody? No, well, okay, well, we, um, well, first of all, let me say that um, this has been very informative. I know the conversation is ongoing and that um, we will encourage Open Dialogue Live to continue the series. And um, I want, also want to say that we are very proud and I'm very happy to announce that the three panelists today are part of Dalhousie's team that receive a COVID-19 rapid response grant to work on health law and policy interventions to generate a more efficient, effective, and equitable response to COVID-19. So colleagues, maybe at the end of that research, we could invite you back to present your findings. That will be extremely um, helpful to us. So I'd like again to thank the panelists. I also want to thank the interpreter and the people behind the scenes and the viewers for being here with us today. And um, just remember the series would be online for anybody who wants to tap into it and feel free um, you know, to, to send your questions to our panelists and um, to open dialogue live. So thank you everybody for being here. And again, uh, it was a great conversation that I hope we could continue. And it's extremely important. It's extremely important that we continue these conversations. We have to use the situation to continue to highlight the um, situation of our vulnerable communities.
So again, thank you for the important work and for sharing your expertise with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.